back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And in today's show, we're going to round up some of the latest stories in astronomy, space travel, and the universe. With us today is our friend Ken Croswell, astronomer from Berkeley, author of a number of great books, including Planet Quest and uh, The Universe at Midnight and Magnificent Mars. We're going to talk to Ken about some of the latest developments. First of all, the moon. We're going back to the moon. Not just one moon rocket, but at least two different kinds of moon rockets are now being proposed to take us back to the moon. One, the SLS booster rocket sponsored by NASA itself, but also a privately funded moon rocket, the Falcon Heavy, bankrolled by a billionaire, Elon Musk of SpaceX, and not to mention that Jeff Bezos of Amazon, he also wants to field a moon rocket that'll take us back to the moon. And then to Mars. Yes, Mars is on the calendar for NASA. By 2030 or so, we hope to be on Mars. However, there's a new report coming out that shows that, well, a trip to Mars is rather dangerous because of radiation. We forget the fact that, well, outer space is more radioactive than the surface of the Earth. So we'll talk to Ken about some of the dangers about going to Mars. And then, the Japanese scored a tremendous bullseye intercepting an asteroid asteroid in outer space. So then the question is, well, what is an asteroid? What's the difference between an asteroid, a comet, and a meteor? So we'll talk about the latest developments in asteroid science with Dr. Ken Croswell, and we'll also get an update as to what's happening with extrasolar planets and mysteries of the galaxies itself. Is there a void out there, a space between the stars and galaxies that leave us scratching our heads as to what could possibly cause these galactic voids? So, Ken, once again, glad you could be on Science Fantastic. Glad to be here, Michelle. Okay, well, the moon is uh, the talk of the town. Uh, not one, but at least two different kinds of moon rockets are now being proposed to go back to the moon. But first of all, let's get some basic information about the moon itself. First of all, how old is the moon, roughly speaking? And how do we know? And where did the moon come from anyway? Or what's the latest theories about the origin of the moon? Well, the moon is the nearest celestial body, the one natural body that goes around the Earth. There are other planets out there that have many moons. We have just one. But our moon is quite big, and it's about as old as the Earth. The entire solar system is four and a half billion years old. So the sun, the Earth, the moon, all the planets, the asteroids, comets, they're all that old. We know that by dating, radioactive dating of meteorites, which we believe come from asteroids. And that establishes the ages of uh, our, our solar system. And we think that the moon arose very violently when an object, a large object, hit the very young Earth and, and flew, uh, threw up enormous amounts of material from the Earth. And the impactor and that Earth material conglomerated into the moon that we see today. So the Earth had a very violent birth. But not a unique situation because we also think that the moons of Pluto, Pluto has five moons. We also think that those moons formed in the same way, that the large object hit the planet Pluto and kicked up debris. And lately people have also been talking that perhaps the two moons of Mars, which are very small, much smaller than our moon, they have formed in the same way. So bottom line is the Earth's moon formed through a collision, and we now have that moon up there, and there are some people who even think that if the moon weren't there, we wouldn't be here because the tide that the moon creates encourages life, which arose, we think, in the seas, to migrate onto the land. So it's entirely possible that if the moon didn't exist, we might right now be having this conversation underwater. And that's assuming, of course, that we would have developed intelligence if we had never been onto the land. 
Now, some astronomers have noted that our moon is rather large compared to the size of the Earth, meaning that it would help to stabilize the, the spin of the Earth so the Earth doesn't wobble and spin out of control. So in some sense, isn't it a good thing that we have a moon to keep, to keep the Earth on a stable orbit? Yes, uh, it's a very good thing that we have a large moon. Mars, in contrast, has only two small moons, and those moons really don't do anything for Mars. But the moon, as you say, does stabilize the Earth's axial tilt. The Earth's axial tilt is 23.4 degrees, and over millions and millions of years, that tilt changes, but only by two or three degrees. So it's not much. In contrast, the Martian axial tilt goes all over the place, from like zero degrees to 60 degrees, and that's all because Mars lacks a large moon. So you're absolutely right. It is a good thing that the moon stabilizes the Earth's axis, and that that gives us a more stable climate. And so who knows? Maybe if we, again, if we didn't have that moon, maybe life on Earth would be very different. It might not even have developed into advanced life the way it has here on Earth. Now, Venus is our twin, our evil twin, because it is so breathtakingly hot. And uh, However, because Venus has no moon at all, isn't it possible that in the past, Venus actually tumbled in its orbit? Well, Venus is closer to the sun than we are, and the big problem with Venus is it's incredibly hot. And I don't know that that's due to a lack of a moon, but it's simply that Venus is closer to the sun than we are, you are right in a sense it is a twin because it's very this the planet is the most similar in diameter and mass, but its surface temperature is eight hundred and sixty degrees Fahrenheit, so not a pleasant place to be. What we don't know is whether Venus was ever a more pleasant place the way Earth currently is, or whether it started off bad and stayed bad. And in fact there was a paper that appeared by some Japanese scientists a few years ago saying that uh, quite likely Venus may have always been a bad planet. Thus, there were never oceans on Venus the way the Earth has oceans. And so Venus may have been a bad planet from the start. But in any event, uh, it's definitely not a place you'd want to move to. Okay, and also people are speculating that the moon has uh, a certain amount of uh, water ice which would be great for astronauts, so they could use the water and purify it for drinking purposes, or break it up into oxygen and hydrogen for breathing, and also for rocket fuel. The hydrogen can also be used for rocket fuel. So tell us a little bit about how how it's possible that you could have ice on the moon. Well, the moon has essentially no atmosphere, but the South Pole has craters, that are permanently shielded from the sun, and their water ice can actually gather. A similar process happens, believe it or not, on the planet Mercury at the North Pole of Mercury. So these seemingly hostile worlds can indeed have water ice, and as you say, it's very nice to have that stuff there, both for drinking and also for practical use, like, you know, rocket fuel and other things as well. Okay, now, some people have speculated over the years that maybe we can have a commercial benefit by going to the moon, by mining on the moon. However, uh, some people say, well, why bother to mine the moon when you can mine the Earth and make it a lot cheaper? But what are your thoughts about any commercial value? And we'll take a short commercial break, but after the break, we'll talk a little bit about helium-3. I mean, are there any valuable chemicals at all that can be harvested when we go back to the the moon. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Ken Croswell, and he's an astronomer at Berkeley and author of a number of great books. Go to his website. And today we're talking about, well, a roundup of stories concerning outer space, beginning with the moon. We're going back to the moon, perhaps by the end of 2019, an unmanned space probe will go orbiting around the moon, and then eventually NASA wants to have an orbiter, an orbiter not around the Earth, but an orbiter around the moon to be used as a stepping stone to go to Mars. So with us today is once again astronomer Ken Croswell talking about the latest developments in astronomy. Well, Ken, we talked about the moon 
We talked about its properties. And the question is, well, is there any commercial value to going to the moon, or is it really just a dead rock? Some people talk about helium-3. Other people say that, well, why bother to mine the moon when you can mine the Earth? Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, to be honest, I don't really know what the future holds. It's hard to predict what's going to happen 100 years from now. But the problem, of course, is getting into space is so very expensive that if you are going to mine something, whatever you mine has to be incredibly precious to justify the cost. But, again, how can anyone predict what the cost of anything is going to be 100 years from now? I mean, who knows what the price of a rocket launch will be? Uh, who knows what the price of helium-3 will be or, or gold or anything else you would want to mine? I would also point out that every now and then asteroids pass by the Earth, and perhaps those asteroids could be mined. It's a lot easier to transport stuff from an asteroid because the gravity of an asteroid is so very weak, and asteroids contain valuable materials too. But, again, who knows what the cost are going to be and the benefits are going to be in, in the very far future. It's hard to predict. It's very hard to predict. Okay. Well, we're going back to the moon starting next year. The SLS booster rocket is already primed so that it can send an orbiter to go around the moon, perhaps by the end of 2019. And not to mention the fact that Elon Musk is not too far behind. He has his own moon rocket, the Falcon Heavy, which has been tested. It actually was launched from Cape Canaveral, from the very same launch pad that sent the Apollo spacecraft going to the moon. And he launched the Falcon Heavy right from there, not to mention the fact that he's also now recruiting astronauts to go back to the moon and eventually to Mars. There's a Japanese billionaire, uh, Mr. Maezawa, who has paid, who knows, uh, tens of millions of dollars, and he basically bought out the entire spacecraft. That's right. The BFR, a new rocket designed by Elon Musk, will take this crew of astronauts, amateurs basically, to the moon for a price. Now, what does BFR stand for? We don't really know. B stands for big, R stands for rocket, and F stands for, well, whatever your imagination will carry. But, yes, we're going back to the moon. Now, we're also going to Mars, because the presidential directive has said that the national goals will be the moon, Mars, and beyond. But there was a story that came out just last week, talking about the fact that, well, outer space could be dangerous, could be radioactive. So what are your thoughts about the dangers of radiation in outer space, especially because a mission to Mars may take two years? Yes, it is a, it's a hazard we've known about for a very long time. Obviously, the faster you can get to Mars, the better, because there is all this radiation you know, from the sun, from solar flares, and also cosmic rays from beyond the solar system. And so the longer astronauts are in space, the longer they will be exposed to this radiation. And I'm sure astronauts going to Mars would also welcome a much shorter trip. So if anyone can figure out a way to get to Mars faster than two years, I sure hope. I sure hope the trip would be a lot faster than two years. That would be a very good thing. Now, you wrote a book, Magnificent Mars, so let's say a few things about what it would be like if you were an astronaut to walk on the surface of Mars. First of all, it is red, uh, perhaps because of uh, rust, but what about the sandstorms, and what would it be like to walk on Mars, given the fact that it's so cold? It is indeed very cold. The atmosphere is very thin. The sky is pink rather than blue because the, the, the dust from Mars gets up into the atmosphere. And you would definitely need a spacesuit because there's essentially no oxygen in that very thin atmosphere. The, uh, the atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. and Most of the rest is nitrogen. So there's essentially no oxygen to breathe. So the first thing you would need is a spacesuit, and you need to stay warm, especially during the nights when it gets down to typically minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a, it's a very cold place, a very dry place, although there is ice beneath the surface, especially in the polar region of Mars. So you would have water to drink. 
Okay, now, going to Mars, some people think that maybe lava tubes would provide shelter because, of course, you have micrometeorites, it's very cold, plus you have radiation. So what are your thoughts about using lava tubes to have a, a quick fix, that is, to have a simple way of creating a, a, a Mars base on Mars? Well, it would certainly be one place you could set up shop on Mars. Uh, there are other places as well. You would certainly want to be in a place that's scientifically interesting. I think the canyons of Mars are very interesting to explore. The volcanoes of Mars are interesting to explore, and you don't really have much danger of their erupting, unlike here on Earth. So there are a lot of great places to set up shop on on Mars. You would want to be close to water. You would want water beneath the surface, so that would probably mean you would want to land at fairly high latitudes so that you have water ice beneath the surface. But, uh, yeah, certainly uh, you would need to occasionally take shelter from these global dust storms. Mars occasionally has dust storms, not like here on Earth, which is just a localized area, but the entire planet can get swept up in a dust storm. In fact, there's a picture, a Hubble picture in my book, Magnificent Mars, that shows a global dust storm in progress on the planet Mars. Now, what about the dimming possibilities of life on Mars? Recently, it was revealed the fact that there is a liquid lake of liquid water, a lake of liquid water underneath the ice caps. So doesn't that give us the possibility that there could be maybe microbial life within these underground lakes? What are your thoughts? Well, there certainly is that possibility. Anywhere you have liquid water, then we get very excited and we think, hey, maybe there could be some form of life there. Water is a very common material in the solar system, but most of it's frozen. For example, the rings of Saturn are made of water ice. Pluto has a lot of water ice. The thing that makes Earth so special is the water is liquid. And Mars has certainly has water ice beneath the surface. If, in fact, this liquid lake is confirmed, that that does suggest that that could be a place that might have some form of primitive life. And that would be very exciting because it would mean that life had developed not just on Earth, but also on Mars. Okay, now, of course, the pot of gold is to create a primitive settlement on Mars. Elon Musk envisions perhaps a million people eventually living on the red planet. However, that means you're going to have to change the atmosphere a bit. It's cold, it's not hospitable, and you have to begin the process of terraforming. Uh, Elon Musk mentions the possibility of detonating hydrogen bombs on the polar ice caps to speed up the melting process. Other people have advocated um, solar satellites that can beam down solar energy onto the ice caps to melt them. So do you think that that's plausible? Again, not in this century, but maybe in the next century, the be beginnings of melting the ice caps so that liquid water runs freely over the Martian surface. What are your thoughts? Well, I, the latter approach sounds better. I, I don't like the idea of hydrogen bombs blowing things up, but certainly if you can direct some of the light from the sun toward Mars and, and give it a warmer environment and, a, most importantly, a thicker atmosphere, that would be wonderful. Because you need not just the liquid water, but you also need a much thicker atmosphere. Because if you have a thicker atmosphere, that can trap more warmth from the sun, just as Earth's atmosphere traps warmth from the sun. The, the, the Earth is 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it would be if we didn't have the carbon dioxide and water vapor in the atmosphere. We need to do something similar to that for Mars. And isn't it true that we're going to have to create some kind of agriculture on Mars? Some people think we should genetically modify algae so that algae can thrive in this carbon-rich but cold atmosphere. Other people think we should perhaps experiment with different kinds of crops that could survive the Martian winters. Well, let's take a short commercial break. And afterwards, we're going to continue discussion of exploring the universe with Ken Croswell, astronomer at Berkeley. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're summing up some of the latest developments in astronomy and the universe. With us once again is Ken Croswell, astronomer at Berkeley, author of a number of great books. One of my favorites is The Universe at Midnight. He's also written Magnificent Mars, Magnificent uh, Universe. He's written Planet Quest and a whole bunch of Great books that'll introduce you to your backyard, that is, the universe. So, when we last left off, we were talking about Mars and the fact that it's going to take maybe a 100 years before we can have a permanent settlement on Mars. And then the question is, well, what do we do when we get to Mars? One is to perhaps melt the ice to create rocket fuel from hydrogen, oxygen for breathing, liquid water for for agriculture perhaps, genetically modified crops, be, begin to melt some of the polar ice caps to get the process started. But some people think that, well, that's a lot of work just for a small settlement. So what are your thoughts about some people like Elon Musk who want to create a multi-planet species? Sounds like science fiction, but he wants an insurance policy in case a meteor asteroid blows up the Earth. I once interviewed Carl Sagan, the astronomer, and he said that we should become a two-planet species. We need an insurance policy in case something bad happens to the Earth. So what are your thoughts? Will something bad happen to the Earth eventually? Do we really have to go to Mars? What are your thoughts? Well, I hope nothing bad happens to the Earth anytime soon, but it makes sense to have an insurance policy. If we're on more than one planet, then if something terrible happens to the Earth and everyone on Earth dies, then at least the human race can continue. It would obviously continue in a very diminished capacity, but it would be very nice to have an establishment on some other world besides the Earth. Now, that doesn't have to be Mars. It could be the Moon. But those are clearly the two obvious places where we might want to set up a colony. Um, So, yes, I think it does make sense. But keep in mind, this is all going to be very expensive. But, you know, you mentioned insurance. But, uh, you know, insurance, if you think about it, uh, this is ensuring that the human race will survive. So that's a pretty huge benefit given, uh, given what would happen if the Earth were to be destroyed in some way. Okay, well, moving on, let's talk about asteroids, meteors, and comets. Uh, The Japanese recently uh, sent a probe to an asteroid and made headlines when they were successful. But first of all, let's get some definitions off the ground. What is an asteroid, and how does it differ from a meteor and a comet? Because we hear these terms all the time, but what's the difference between all of them? Yes, an asteroid is a rocky object in space. Most of them lie between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. That's where the very first one was found. That's Ceres. It's the largest. It was discovered in 1801. And we now know of thousands and thousands of asteroids in the solar system, some of which don't stay between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. They come closer to Earth. Meteors are what you see when a a bit of an asteroid or a comet burns up in our atmosphere. And if any part of that object makes it to the Earth, what lands is called a meteorite. And a comet differs from an asteroid in that it has water ice. And when it approaches the sun, the water ice vaporizes, and we see this beautiful tail. So you can think of uh, the difference between asteroids and comets. The asteroids are rocky, and comets have water ice. Okay, Ken, we're going to have to take another short commercial break. Once again, you are listening to Science Fantastic, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again, our special guest today is once again astronomer Ken Croswell of Berkeley. And we're rounding up some of the major stories in astronomy and science. And one of the big stories concerns the fact that the Japanese successfully landed on an asteroid. But first, we have to get some definitions off the ground. The difference between meteors, comets, asteroids. And the question is, what is the relationship between between these three, given the fact that meteors sometimes come off the tail of a comet, and sometimes an asteroid can become a meteor. What's the relationship between these three? 
Well, asteroids and comets are basically leftover objects from the birth of the planet, the, the planets of our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so forth. And the meteorites that are on the ground come from the asteroids. They're objects that survive the fiery passage through the Earth's atmosphere. The meteor itself is the flash of light you see as the object is burning up. And both asteroids and comets can give rise to meteors, although most meteor showers do come from debris shed by comets. So basically, asteroids and comets are the progenitors of meteors and meteorites. Okay, now, exactly what did the Japanese do, and why did it get so much publicity, given the fact that, well, an asteroid is only a piece of rock out there, not a space, but what did they do? Well, this was quite an amazing mission. They landed on an asteroid, a very small asteroid. This asteroid is about half a mile in diameter, so it's really small. And they landed a number of landers and rovers on this asteroid. This asteroid is so small that if you were to stand on it, you could actually jump off it into space. It's got such a weak gravity, okay? And for the same reason, this asteroid is not round the way the Earth and the Moon are. The Earth and the Moon are large objects with lots of gravity, and so they squeeze themselves into a round shape. But this asteroid looks more like a cube. And the reason we care about asteroids, I'd say, is twofold. First, as I mentioned earlier, some of these objects cross the Earth's orbit, including this one, and so we really want to know more about these dangers to the Earth. And the second reason we want to know about asteroids is because they are the building blocks of the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all of which consist mostly of rock and iron. So we think that the Earth formed as objects like asteroids came together. And in particular, we'd really like to know where the Earth's water came from. Water is one thing that makes the Earth very special. And we used to think that water came from comets. Comets, after all, do have water ice. That's what. That's why they you know, light up so beautifully when they approach the sun. But the isotopic composition of the water in comets is quite different from the isotopic composition of the water on Earth. So we now think that comets did not provide Earth most of its water. And instead, we're now looking to the asteroids. It may be that the asteroids are the source of Earth's water. And so that's one thing we'd very much like to know about uh, the asteroids of our solar system. Did they supply us with most of our water? Now, when we think of asteroids, we think of a large piece of rock, a rock devoid of an atmosphere, devoid of ice. It's just a big rock in space. But you're saying that perhaps these rocks delivered most of the water on the planet Earth? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it's a possibility um, because it's looking like the comets have not been able to supply most of Earth's water. So, yes, it, the, the current thinking is probably asteroids are more likely source for the Earth's water than the comets. Isn't it also true that some astronomers have speculated that some of these asteroids are not really solid at all? They could be a bunch of smaller asteroids held together by a weak gravitational attraction. And anyone who tries to land, anyone who tries to intercept and land one of these things would be very surprised to find that the asteroid is not solid at all and will essentially split apart. And it means that one day if we're threatened by a monster asteroid, we have to make sure that we know the composition of it because maybe it consists of lots of loosely bound smaller asteroids. So what are your thoughts about what little we know about what asteroids are really made of? Yes, that's a good point. If we want to somehow get rid of an asteroid that's heading to impact the Earth, it would be very helpful to know exactly how it's held together. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again, our special guest is astronomer Ken Croswell of Berkeley, author of a number of great books about astronomy, including Magnificent Universe, Magnificent Mars, The Universe at Midnight, Planet Quest. Go to his website, kencroswell.com, and you can find out more about his work.
Once again, we're talking about some of the latest developments in astronomy, and another big development concerns extrasolar planets. The Kepler satellite was the big workhorse of this event, and it found about 4,000 planets orbiting other stars in outer space, but unfortunately, it got crippled. Its gyroscope became unstable, and is no longer as useful as it used to be, but now we have a new probe out there called TESS, and there's some new developments concerning these extrasolar planets. So give us a little quick summary of what is new about the search for, one day, finding a twin of the Earth in outer space. Well, what is new is a planet called Kepler-1625b. We've known about this planet for a little while. And there's a claim this week that the Hubble Space Telescope has confirmed tentatively, the detection of a moon around the planet that goes around Kepler-1625. Now, this, this discovery definitely needs to be further confirmed, but the scientists have detected a potential moon outside our solar system. This would be, if confirmed, the first extrasolar moon ever found. We, of course, know of lots of moons in our solar system. Almost 200 go around the various planets of the solar system. This particular planet is a bit closer to its star than the Earth is to the sun, but it's, it's rather similar. It has an orbital period of 287 days versus the Earth, of course, 365 and a fourth days. And this moon, well, this moon is a really big moon if it exists. It is potentially the size of Neptune, if you can believe that. So we have a Jupiter-sized planet with a moon that's maybe as large as the planet Neptune. So as I say, this discovery needs confirmation, but if it is confirmed, it will be quite exciting as the discovery of the first extrasolar moon ever seen. Well, it's amazing, right? I mean, who would have thought? Yes. Who would have thought 20 years ago, if you were to predict 20 years hence, what we would find in outer space? So many different varieties of solar systems, and our solar system seems to be the oddball, seems to be the exception so far, right? So isn't it true that we have not yet found a twin of our planet and a twin of our solar system in outer space? All these other systems look quite different from our system, right? That's right. There's enormous variety and diversity among the solar systems of the galaxy. And we have yet to find our match in terms of a, a solar system that has a star just like the sun and a planet just like the Earth. But there are hundreds of, and, of billions of stars in our galaxy, and, and we've only just started searching. So I, I have confidence that sooner or later we will find a planet the size of the Earth located at the Earth's distance from the sun, from another star. Now, I understand that you've also written an article recently about a strange void that has been found in outer space. We think of the sky being full of stars, evenly distributed, but you're talking about a void out there. Isn't that rather unusual? Yes, this is the cover story of the October 2018 issue of Sky and Telescope, the local void. You're not going to believe how huge this void is. It starts just 4 million light years from us on the other side of our galaxy, and stretches for a quarter billion light years of a near emptiness, almost no galaxies or stars at all. And we call this the local void. We don't know much about it. It doesn't have many galaxies in it, obviously. And that's what the story in Sky and Telescope is all about. So if this sounds intriguing, by all means, pick up the October issue of Sky and Telescope, and you can read all about it. Now, according to the Big Bang Theory, uh, the universe exploded uh, over, well, about 14 billion years ago, but it exploded rather evenly, and that's why the night sky looks rather uniform. So what is a void, a void doing out there when we thought that the universe was relatively uniform? What could cause that? Well, over 14 billion years, tiny differences in density actually amplify themselves. So the Denser regions ultimately form galaxies and groups of galaxies and clusters, and then the less dense regions expand over time and become these huge voids, such as the local void. So that explains how voids arise. They start off as simply under densities of matter in the early universe and then expand and eventually become, well, in the case of the local void, a quarter billion light years across. 
Now, when we look at the entire universe itself, we see that it's filled with a background radiation from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is extremely uniform, meaning that the universe, the universe probably started off in a very, very uniform state, but, but, there have been some irregularities found in the microwave background radiation that is tantalizing because this is the entire visible universe we're now talking about. Some people even claim that these are scars, remnants of parallel universes, that maybe our universe collided with another universe, maybe the scar left over from that ancient collision is still with us today. I once thought this idea was rather preposterous, but I've attended talks, talks by real cosmologists who speculated that maybe some of the irregularities in the cosmic background radiation are due to the leftovers of ancient collisions with other universes. Now, is that preposterous, or do you think that there could be a case made that our universe itself collided with other universes? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know anything about parallel universes, to be honest, but what I do know is that the ripples we see in the cosmic microwave background are actually the beginning stages of the creation of these voids. So it's very relevant in that regard. Okay, well, Ken, unfortunately, we have run out of time, so thank you so much for being on Science Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michelle. Once again, our special guest today was Dr. Ken Croswell of Berkeley, author of a number of great books. Go to his website, kencroswell.com. Books including The Universe at Midnight, Magnificent Mars, Magnificent uh, Universe, Planet Quests, a number of great books by Dr. Ken Croswell. And you've been listening to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. 